सहनावतु सहनाओ भुनक्तु सहवीर्यं करवावहै नेजस्विनावधीतमस्तु माविद्विशावहै instruction under this title in this extraordinary work Sri Ramana Maharshi gave to us an understanding of what essentially constitutes Karma Yoga Bhakti Yoga Raja Yoga and even Yoga. Though much more can be said about all these four celebrated paths to the ultimate goal of human life, namely liberation, called Nirvana in Buddhism, we have the words Moksha, Mukti and so on. Much more can be said, but what Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi has said in this work is certainly very, very central, very, very essential dimensions of each of these four paths. In the last class, we took a look at four verses which gave the outline of a variation of Jnana Marga called Vichara Marga marked or characterized by inquiry. Inquiry means not to accept something on its face value, not to take the sense of I which may be good or bad for granted. Somebody joked once that you and I operating a little egoistically very many times say to somebody, don't take me for granted, okay? Don't take me for granted. And that speaker talking on Ramana's self-inquiry said, what an irony. We tell everybody not to take us for granted, but we take ourselves for granted. The sense of I which arises in us because of some memories, some beliefs, some conditionings actually deserves to be questioned. It is not true. But one morning our mind says, you are so marvelous and we say, yeah, yeah, I think so. And in the afternoon our mind says, so wretched you are. <laughs> And we say, yeah, I don't know why God has made me this way. I have too many imperfections. So whatever the mind says, without apparently rhyme or reason, carries us away. We get carried away by our own mind. Our mind takes us for a ride. And to question the way our mind operates, is which are a marga. And it was said in the 19th verse, if you ask me in the Jnana Yoga again, which is that one verse that is very central, I would say the 19th verse, Aham ayam kuto bhavati iti chinvataha. For somebody who inquires how this I is arising, 99 out of 100 do not question at all. 
they do not question the image that they have of themselves. If the image is bad, they simply suffer. If the self-image is good, they enjoy. Image of oneself in the mirror that is physical or image of ideas, how these days I am popular or some other time, an unfavorable image. Ninety-nine out of hundred do not question it. But one out of hundred says, what is this thought? Ahamayam kuto bhavati. This thought that I am at fault or I am a very virtuous person, this thought that I am in danger or this thought that I have nothing to worry here onwards deserves to be examined again. Therefore, to examine as Jay Krishnamurti calls it, to notice the movement of thought, that is the expression he uses. Thought has its own movement. Our memories, our concepts, or our self-judgments have their own movement. Many times in response to some stimulus, we may be at some point of time very sattvic with all plans to maybe sit down and repeat God's name. And our eyes fall upon a magazine where there is some political news and some memories arise. Rather than starting our Om Namo Narayanaya, we think about that politician. Then we think about something that is connected by association. So, how our mind unexpectedly takes its own twist and turn is very rightly called the movement of the mind, movement of thought. And the great thinker, though with a very strong atheistic flavor, J. Krishnamurti asked us, to notice the movement of thought and in quietly, non-judgmentally, but with all alertness, if we watch the movement of thought, there comes about great amount of self-learning, self-knowing. <coughs> it is one thing to have some idea about who we are but it is quite another to know what we are at a given point of time. In the Vedanta, of course, it is said we are Satchidananda Brahma. That is the ultimate realization. But at a given point of time, I may be biased in some matters. I may be having undue sympathy in some matters. And in some other matters, this I in me, might be so indifferent, doesn't care at all. So, how my conditionings have formed, constructed, built the I in me, one has to know. Generally, we are not listening to ourselves, we don't listen to others too. That a hundred people come and say to us, look, you better change your ways. We just hear from one ear and leave it through the other ear. Therefore, in simpler language, introspection is a great tool of a honestly religious person. An honestly religious person introspects. That's a simple language. But a more philosophically correct language is one watches and understands. Introspection may have its own analysis and other limitations. That's another topic altogether. But drawing your attention one last time to the 19th verse, if one inquires how this image, which is the ego, how this bundle of thoughts 
which builds our ego arose. How it came? Take a look at it. Maharshi says, if one inquires, Ai patati aham, that image cannot stay long. That image, either the notion we are better than somebody, or the unpleasant idea we are nowhere, all others went ahead, whatever. That image falls. The great lady thinker, Vimala Takar, she was a disciple of Inoba Bhave to begin with. Later on she came under a little bit influence of J. Krishna Murti, a Maharashtrian lady but who knew Gujarati also very well. I think she lived in both Maharashtra and Gujarat and her English also was so good. She spoke in many European and American universities. Check out Vimala, V-I-M-A-L-A. Takar, T-H-A-K-A-R, it's a Maharashtrian surname, not Takar of Gujarat. Amazing. If you ask me to name four or five people whose writings have great depth, great clarity, great beauty of language, I would point out Vimla Takar. And she at a certain place says, is it possible for us to have Image-free consciousness. Look at that expression. Image-free consciousness. You and I have consciousness. We are conscious. We are alive and the hallmark of being alive is we are conscious. But generally this consciousness in us is weighed down, is pulled down by varieties of images we have about ourselves and images we have about people. All mischief of memories. If somebody who, let's say, some Sardarji had ill-treated me and I meet a Sardarji in Fort Worth, memory of that Sardarji who was rough with me makes me think of being a bit careful about this Sardarji. Because I have an image of how Sardarjis tend to be. So this is the human mind's limitation. Can I look at this Sardarji or this South Indian? Can I look at this Italian or that African with no preconceived notion? Let me see him, let me understand him as he is. I have no business to carry some memories over here and presume that this man from Zambia, that lady from Toronto has to be like the one I met last time. So without making it long, to be aware of how memories are at work and constantly are constructing images is a powerful exercise. And if we do that, our mind begins to behave. Otherwise, our mind itself is our worst enemy. So, the ego takes a back seat then. That is image-free consciousness. That is perceiving as things are. Not colored by images, memories. Then the ego doesn't stay. Now, the last verse we saw yesterday talked about when the ego dies, it's not that we become non-functional. We are as functional as ever before. And from deep within us, Maharshi assured, there arises another I, a sense of I, which all along was limited, is replaced by an intuitive grasp of a new I, which is unlimited, which is ever free, which is ever secure. The limited I, with all its glory, somebody may say, I am the greatest scholar of the world today, <laughs> but he also has his own fear. Everybody has fear. The richest man also has his own fear. The government may make some new rules. The government may take away my wealth. 
or I may be attacked by somebody. Okay. There was a king, Bhartrahari, he wrote 100 verses on Vairagya. Bhartrahari is Vairagya Shatakam. He has a shloka where he says, those who are looking pretty have fear of losing their looks. Those who have wealth are fear of the king taking away his wealth. Those who are scholarly are afraid of some new scholar coming from another town and defeating this scholar in a vada. Those who are young are afraid of getting old. And there's a shloka which at the end says, Sarvam vastu bhayanvitam bhuvi drunam vairagya meva abhayam Everything that you cling to can bring fear. The moment you say, I have this, I have 